Good morrow nerds, it is I. Now I was hoping to have a massive long two hour video about using ChatGPT in tabletop RPGs for you guys out this month, but as you can see, it's not here yet. So in the meantime what I've done is I've found about five YouTube shorts of varying degrees of quality, and I'll be going through each of them and seeing what they have to offer. The way this will work is I'll play each of them through in full, and then I'll give my commentary and my analysis and uh, you know see what we can uh, learn from them, or at the very least have a bit of a laugh. So, if you'd like some lower brow entertainment this time around, then sit down, buckle up, and prepare your popcorn. And while you're at it, if you could please hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications, I really do appreciate it. So, we begin with something a bit lighthearted. Okay buddy, we're gonna play a game called Dungeons and Dragons, an experience where we tell a collective story using only our imagination and mathematics. Okay, uh, explain to me the appeal of such a game. By untethering ourselves from the limitations of reality, we are allowed to live vicariously in a world of our own design as any person or creature that we wish. And what have you chosen to live as in this world? My character is known as a bard, a being that draws power from wit, charm, and artistic expression. In addition, they are famous for their knowledge and competency in all things flirtatious and erotic. I see, and you have chosen this personification because such things are unreachable to you in your current state. Now I'm sure we've all seen it, some people insist on playing what is basically themselves, and other people, well, I mean listen, we want to think that other people like us from time to time. As for my current group, we have a compassionate healer, a charismatic public speaker, a gutsy tech, a glorified taxi driver, and someone who knows how to fight. I will let you guess who is playing themselves and who is laughing as their idealized self. But if you do want to convince people that you're a master of flirtation and all things erotic, then I would pay close attention to short number two. It's not about changing how they sound, but changing how they speak. I know that sounds like the exact same thing, but it's actually not. And I'm not confusing you, you're confusing yourself. Yes, like robots. For example, let's say you have a really nervous character. They might speak really quickly because their nerves are constantly there and they don't really know how to cope with it and they have to constantly socialize with the party and that's really hard for them. Maybe your character is very smart and conniving, so they speak very slowly and very precisely and enunciate everything they say because every word counts. Or maybe you have a character that's super full of themselves, so every time they speak, it sounds like everything is an absolute fact and is completely correct. Or maybe your character has a very strong hyperfixation that they kept info dumping on people that didn't really give a shit and it started to make them feel bad because it was also just kind of annoying everybody else and nobody else wanted that info dump so they started the YouTube channel and started talking about it all the fucking time just to call the voices. <clears throat> well, that escalated quickly. But to be fair, this is actually pretty correct. My first ever D&D campaign as a game master, I was running Curse of Strahd, which is set in what is essentially fantasy Eastern Europe. And quite frankly, if they well, you realize that with all the NPCs, here's the same accent, you have to mix things up. For example, if you are doing, say, the eponymous Strad, it pays well to enunciate everything, to slow it down, to give him an air of grace and grandeur. If, on the other hand, you need someone annoying, make them very nasal. I'm gonna be honest though, after a while I did stop using Eastern European accents for everyone. I did use the German for some of them, and to be fair, it does work. Uh, there are the, the Transylvanian Saxons in Romania. Or at least there were. I believe that now they are mostly in Utah, but this is besides the point. And, you know, even if you aren't doing accents, this still does help, you know, give some characterization and help distinguish, you know, when you're speaking out of character and when you're speaking in character, which can always be tough when people don't, you know, voice their characters, which obviously is a personal choice, but anything you can do to make things easier, you should do. So yeah, good tip. But let's face it, clunky characterization is not the only thing that can go wrong at the table. Cue short number three. I need help. I was a dungeon master and my friends tried to tame a mimic and I tried to stop them, but they rolled four 20s in a row. So I said if everyone rolls 20s, they could tame it knowing that it's nearly impossible, but somehow they did it. Okay, first I'm going to answer your question, but then I'm going to give you some actual advice. Two, let your players have a pet mimic. They're not that tough. They're not that smart. There's not a lot they can do for the players other than take some damage, deal some damage, and be kind of fun. Having a pet mimic will probably just be awesome. But let me give you some real advice. You said you tried to stop your players. Why? You should never try to stop your players. 
Don't forget, you're the dungeon master. You dictate the rules and the limits of the game. If you don't want something to be possible in the game, it doesn't need to be possible. Just don't make it possible. You should also always be excited and plan for your players to succeed. Because at the end of the day, that's kind of the whole point of the game. They're the main characters. They're supposed to win. As soon as you say they can try to do something really cool, they're going to. So you better be ready. I think one of the biggest challenges that a lot of kind of newer game masters will face is knowing when to roll and when not to roll. I think this guy kind of hints at this here, but there is a point to be made with this. If you want something to happen, don't call for a roll, just let it happen. Uh, if you don't want something to happen, don't call for a roll, just don't let it happen. Now, to be fair with that second one, players really can argue, and argue hard, when there is something they want to do that you do not want them to do. And you can take a few tactics in this sort of situation. You can, you know, use logical arguments. For instance, you know, horses and donkeys may be trainable animals, but zebras aren't. They're actually too dumb. And are you really going to tell me that a mimic is smarter than a zebra? <sighs> you probably are. But even then, there are always more arguments where that came from. Y you can take a very authoritative approach of, I'm the GM, I say what goes, you do not do anything I displease. Oh. And the truth is, that doesn't work. Or at the very least, if it does, it will kill your game in the process. If there is something out there that your players are trying to do that you don't want them to do, just be honest. Hey guys, listen, I spend hours and hours every week trying to prepare this, and I literally don't have the brain power to cope with a pet mimic. Can we just leave this be? So yeah, there are a few ways. I tend to actually go more for the logical argument side of things. I will gladly get into a bit of a verbal fisticuffs with my players now and then, and they seem to enjoy it, I seem to enjoy it. But yeah, you really do need to find a good way to set boundaries with your players. Because for natural 20s, yeah, it's a 1 in 160,000 chance of it happening, but sooner or later, it's going to happen. So yeah, just set proper boundaries, and you never have to worry. But sometimes, when you argue with your GM, it doesn't go too well. Maybe they get annoyed. And if they do, then maybe short number 4 can help you figure it out. If you're new to d and I've got a tip for you. This is how to tell if your DM is just putting regular consequences and stakes into your game so that your actions have meaning and value and there's risk and actual reward while you're playing, or if they're totally fed up with your nonsense and are trying to kill you. And it's all in the tone. Are you ready? Yeah, so uh, go ahead and roll me a dexterity saving throw with a uh, disadvantage. Yeah, go ahead and roll me a dexterity saving throw with disadvantage? If you only ever hear the second one, your DM has been trying to kill you for the last several sessions in a row, but you keep rolling yourself out of it, so may the odds be ever in your favor. So, as it happens, I actually disagree with this guy. If your GM is annoyed with you and has been trying to kill you for several sessions, they are not angry and animated. They sound like this. Roll a dexterity saving throw with disadvantage. They sound like they are hoping that you will roll a natural one, and that even if you don't, they will treat you like you did, because you're a filthy maggot, and you deserve such ill treatment. And obviously, none of my players have ever experienced any of this from me before, because I'm a lovely GM who never gets angry. And even if they did, it was just voicing, I was just doing the thing that the psycho-characterization lady told me to do. It, it's fine, it's not... Come on, guys, come on! Let's close things out with something nice and reflective. So while trying to think about what to discuss this week, like, well, maybe racial benefits and how Wizards of Coast changed that, or even try to pull up specific spells that have vague descriptions that we can discuss, I realized that, you know, there's a lot of debates in D&D, especially between players and DMs and how things go, whether it's uh, gods, uh, spells like we discussed, racial features, how certain effects will affect the world, what vagueness such as you no know, druidcraft can accomplish, and you know what? There's just so many. I'm curious. What have you and your DM, or you and your players, actually argued about? And what's a debate that you find really spicy in D and D? Let me know. I'm curious. So, as I said before, my players and I have got into a number of interesting and spirited discussions before. Uh, everything from is there a market for selling the teeth from zombies uh, for use in making dentures? Uh, can we urinate on a female NPC we arrested? Uh, can we turn corpses that we stole into kibble for use in cyberpunk? Can we get inspiration for violating corpses? Can we please, please, please get a striping mule? Look, 
GM, I know I forgot to put ammo in my guns, but can I please, please, please have ammo for the first combat of the campaign? And yeah, you know, that's just how it is. I absolutely love my players. I think. So yeah, it's a wrap. I'm gonna be honest here, I was surprised and I think a little frustrated by the sheer monopoly that D&D has over the RPG shorts world. You know, I'm currently playing Cyberpunk Red, and there's not really much out there except clips of, I believe, infinite-sided dice doing actual play of it, which, I'm gonna be honest, watching RPGs is a bit dull. Uh, watching out-of-context clips of RPGs is even worse. There is a reason that none of those appeared in this, but I do hope that you enjoyed what you saw. As I said, the ChatGPT video is about halfway done, and hopefully it should be out in a middle late next month. Uh, if not, then I'll have to scrounge up some other topic to fill in the void. And uh, if you enjoy this sort of thing, or you enjoy my more usual kind of analytical content, then uh, please like, share, and comment this video, and subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell for more. As always, thank you very much for watching, and until I see you next, farewell.